Actionable books interviews are candid conversations with the world's best business book authors. Here's our next author. We all know businesses should run smart, but what about running healthy? This is the theme of Patrick Lencioni's ninth book, The Advantage. It's been 12 months since we last sat down with Pat, and in that time, The Advantage, his first non-fable, has become his top-selling book of all time. We caught up with Pat in Ottawa to discuss the key lessons from this powerful book. Hey, welcome back for another installment of Actionable Interviews. We're sitting down for round two with the one and only Mr. Patrick Lancioni, um, talking about The Advantage. And for those of you who are keeping score, uh, this book had just come out when we last interviewed Pat, and uh, now I've actually had a chance to read it, which is exciting. Um, so we can talk about some of the content in a little more detail. <laughs> Not necessary to read it, though, really. <laughs> no, you, totally. you get everything from the cover. Totally. Yeah, or this interview. <laughs> so this is, this That's is right. just cannibalizing sales from now until the end. Of that. That's great. Pat, thanks so much for sitting it's down. It's great to be here. Absolutely. Good to see you again, always. You too. We're in Ottawa, uh, Canada. You're saying first time in Ottawa? It is. I can't believe it. It's beautiful. It is beautiful, isn't it? Um, all right, so I want to talk about the book. Uh, this is the first book, and you've written about 600 of them, that is not a fable. That's right. Right. So I love it. I think you mentioned in the beginning the idea that truth is often stranger than fiction. Yeah. Um, and that's, that's absolutely the case. It's, it's, it's a lot of fun to read because although it's not fiction, it is loaded with stories. Case st- stories, yeah. Yeah. Did you have fun putting it together? Absolutely, because we got to go back and think about all the clients we'd worked with. We talked to all of our consultants. Um, around the, the country and around Canada and talked about the clients they'd worked with and got to put stories in about them. And it was really interesting to kind of look at how it all fit together again. Mm-hmm. And so, and again, the truth is stranger than fiction. Some of the stories in there about real people yeah. are stranger than anything I could have made up. <laughs> it's powerful stuff. It's really neat. So, Pat, you're a, you're a, a film guy. Give us the 30-second uh, trailer of what this book's about for those who haven't read it. You know, it's about how to, how to achieve the, the greatest competitive advantage of modern time, of today. I, I mean, like, really modern. It's, a, it's about how to find that last, next competitive advantage that other companies aren't finding because they're, they're still looking for the difference to be in, in the smart areas like, like finance and marketing and technology. Right. And it's, a, it's really about culture, but not in the touchy-feely sense. So that's the 30-second trailer. Okay, perfect. So it's, it, you sort of break companies up with the smart elements of a company and the right. healthy elements of a company, right. right? And the idea that the smart is the stuff we're taught in most business schools, right? Yeah, which is really important. I mean, knowing strategy and marketing and technology and finance and all those things that we learn in business school, you gotta be good at that. Yeah. But pretty much everybody can be good at that today. Yeah. I mean, it's almost permission to play. I mean, all you need is a dummies book or an internet connection, you can learn a lot. Sure. But what separates the great companies from the good ones or the mediocre ones is really creating a healthy organization. So in addition to being smart, they're healthy. And as a result of being healthy and effective, they become smarter. And you know, here, if you look at WestJet, Mm -hmm. it's like anybody can copy their strategy, but what WestJet does in Canada, it's that they have this amazing organization that makes good decisions and people like to work there and their, their customers like to fly. And it's, it's, it's more than just the intellectual part of it. It's about building the kind of organization that does that. Yeah. And you're going to find that to be true in almost any great company mm-hmm. that sets themselves apart. It's really the culture. Mm-hmm. And again, that's not an esoteric, touchy-feely thing where you bring your dogs to work or people dress casually. Right. It's about how you organize the team, how you make decisions, how you clarify things for employees, how you communicate, all of those things. Yeah. And that's, I think that's what I really enjoyed about the book is that um, is that you do a really good job of defining what culture actually is, right. as opposed to the people that are that are doing some of those tactics of you know flex day Friday, but no real thought around why we're doing that, right? Right. And so therefore, it loses momentum. People go, ah, this this healthy organization stuff isn't for us, right? We're gonna right. Because this is not soft at all. Right. And I started my career at Bain and Company as a management consultant, where they beat anything soft out of me. <laughs> and and so I don't really like anything touchy feely. I kind of uh. But this is about how to apply the same sort of rigor. Mm-hmm to building your organization so that you have a competitive advantage like no other. Mm -hmm. And none of this is touchy-feely. It's not catching each other falling out of a tree. It's about doing the simple but critically differentiating things that are going to make an organization much better. Mm -hmm. And and just to add a little bit of uh, sort of um, concreteness to that, um, it's, it's this idea of getting messy, right? It's about going right. beyond the sort of superficial facade of what business should be or the way that we saw it in, in Wall Street or other movies, right? Yeah. And, and, and we're seeing about the human interaction, the actual, I, I care about you, not in a, let's have a big hug every morning, but you know, there's a respect, there's a genuine level of interest in, in each other and what we're doing together. Exactly, right. exactly. Right. Yeah, and it is a, t- a tension, you know. When I worked in, at Bain, I was the creative soft guy. Right. Then when I spent a couple years of my life in human resources and I was the, the driven results guy. Right. And the truth is you've got to have both. Sure. 
And that's kind of what this book says. It's like, how, how can you be a practical believer in organizational health? And how can you be a, a, an understander of, of culture and the impact on the bottom line mm-hmm. without being soft? Here's what I like, is that you're not really in the book trying to convince people that being a healthy organization is important. As you say, people know that. If you ask a leader of companies, is this stuff important? Inevitably, they say yes, but they're not doing it. Exactly. And you talk about three biases, or maybe more, but three that I remember. No, there's three. That's perfect. <laughs> that, um, I'll just edit that piece out. <laughs> right on top. Um, three biases that, that leaders have that stop them from pursuing a healthier organization. Um, and I want to, so for those keeping track, it's sophistication bias, adrenaline bias, and quantification bias. Um, for the sake of time, I want to dive into the adrenaline and quantification biases uh, specifically. Right. Adrenaline bias to me is basically taking the approach that I'm too busy driving to stop for gas uh, sort of mentality. Can you exactly. elaborate on that a little bit? Yeah, I mean, everybody's so busy and they've got, they want things that are going to happen right away and I, I can't stop and they don't realize that they're just not doing the things. It's like we, we talk about you have to slow down to go fast. Right. Race car drivers, if you don't brake going into the turn, you can't accelerate coming out of it. Not make it out of Most it. leaders I work with are adrenaline junkies. They're, they're, they're addicted and they're, 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 the pedal is to the metal the whole time and they're not seeing the benefits of that. You have to slow down to make your organization healthy. You have to slow down occasionally to review where you are. That is going to allow you to get more done. Um, and, and it takes an executive who understands the bigger picture to do that. Bigger picture and longer term. Longer term. What I that, understand, right? Absolutely. Because the quantification thing feeds right, right into that, right? Where if I can't see the results in the next quarter, says someone running a public company, um, I, I'm not going to be able to justify doing this. Right? Yeah, well, and the quantification bias is that, and it's a little bit more too. It says if I can't know exactly what difference it made. Right. And so executives will say, well, Pat, what's the ROI of making my organization healthy? And it's like, it's everything. Right. I mean, go to WestJet or Southwest Airlines and say, what's the ROI of your culture and, and making a health? They'd say, it's everything. Right. But if somebody said, well, tell me exactly how many tickets you sold this month as a result of being healthy versus not being healthy, they'd say, well, we could never precisely measure that because it's too fundamentally attached to everything we do. Right. And for those executives who need to calculate the ROI in this quarter, mm-hmm. they're going to get frustrated. Mm-hmm. However, when I talk to CEOs, I'm like, do you know in your gut that this is going to make the difference between success and not? And they say, yeah. It's like, don't, don't make measurement of that mm-hmm. the thing that keeps you from doing it. But there's a certain responsibility, not just to the leaders, but to the stakeholders in the company, right? Because if they're going to terminate that, that executive for, for slowing down a little bit to then go fast later, they're not going to get a chance to go fast later, right? Right. Well, if you're on a quarterly short leash with your investors... Yeah. You have to make a case for the fact that you are doing something that's going to pay off for that organization in spades mm-hmm. in the longer term. We're not talking about 10 years from now. You can see the benefits of this stuff in months. Sure. Yeah. You really can. But the full impact of it is going to be seen over the course of a number of months. Mm-hmm. And you have to, if, if you're on such a short leash that no one's going to let you invest in the future, well, then that's a tough company to make a healthy organization. organization. Yeah. yeah. But so it sounds to me, though, that if you've got a little bit of leverage in there, it's, it's a communication and over communication of what oh, you're trying to accomplish. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, 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 you know, the truth of the matter is no CEO that I sit down for more than five minutes with mm-hmm. around the content of this denies that they should do this. Oh, sure. Yeah. They're like, we got to do this. I mean, when I started my business, thank the Lord, I would sit down and cold call these CEOs and they would go, yeah, we got to work with you. Mm-hmm. Because when they saw the model, mm-hmm. the four disciplines are like, how can we not do this? Mm-hmm. This would be crazy. It's just a matter of them slowing down long enough to look at what this is and ask themselves, do you think this is going to make your organization better? And every time they say, absolutely, we've got to do it. Right. So we've talked about this from a macro level and sort of big picture stuff. I want to dive down to the micro level, to the the team unit. So now I'm a leader in the large organization. The large organization has said, you know, with a broad brush, yes, we need to be a healthier organization. How does a team leader start to work with their group of eight, nine, ten direct reports to start to create that healthier culture? And it's a two-parter. Um, and yeah. can they do that independent of the rest of the organization as their own little microcosm, or do they have to do it with a larger group? Well, whatever organization we're talking about, if it's a corporation or a department within that corporation, a school, a church, a, a small business, the leaders at the top of that organization have to start. Okay. And they do not have to involve, in fact, they shouldn't involve others until they've got themselves healthy. The first step is we have to become a healthy, cohesive team. Mm -hmm. Because if we're not, then we can't begin to influence the rest of the organization. So the answer is not only do they have to, I mean, can they they leave others out? They have to start with them. So it's the CEO or the department head and his or her direct reports that have to begin this process. And so much of the work comes down to them. Mm -hmm. Once they get behaviorally cohesive... And once they do the second discipline, which is 
answer these six critical questions and really get aligned around them, that's when and only when they have to involve the rest of the organization. Okay. But if they, if they get too quickly to spreading everything to the rest of the organization but they haven't done their job first, it does, it's not going to work. Okay, interesting. Yeah, so, so if I'm a mid-level manager and I don't have access to the, the sort of that core team at the top, if I wanted to implement these types of ideas, am I fighting an uphill battle to try to do it myself? No, focus on your department. Okay. You can absolutely apply. You're the head of your department. Say, okay. I'm going to make my department the healthiest organization possible. And two things are going to happen. One, you're going to start succeeding mm -hmm. more than you ever could before. Secondly, other people in the organization are going to go, what are you guys doing? And that's how you're probably going to influence upward. Good. You're going to get promoted or they're going to say, can you teach us what you're doing? Because your department seems to be doing really well. Yeah. But when you focus too much on, gosh, until the CEO and his or her direct report to do this, I can't do anything. Right. Then, you know, as Stephen Covey used to say, your circle of influence shrinks. Right, sure. So absolutely, this can be applied at any level of an organization. But for the whole organization, it's best when the CEO and his or her direct reports. Sure, do. absolutely. Makes sense. They're um, switching gears a little bit, but on that note, sure. you hit on something really interesting in the book. We're talking about um, when there are more than eight or nine people on a team, Members tend to advocate a heck of a lot more than they inquire. And just a little backstory: inquiry is part of a healthy team because you're constantly challenging each other to learn more rather than trying to push your own point and agenda. Um, so coming back to that quote, what, is there a magic around the eight to nine people? What have you found with team size and structure? Yeah, and it just gets down to this. For, for, it's, it's probably the laws of physics more than anything else, and that is if you have too many people in the room, there's just not going to be a chance for those people to get the floor back right. in a conversation. Right. And, and if you know that you're not going to get the floor back, then you're going to use the precious time you have to, to advocate for something and say, this is what I think we should do. You're not going to say, what do you mean by that? Or can you explain more about what you said earlier? Right. So when you have too many people in the room, there's just not enough opportunities for everybody to really have a c communication. And so it's really just a matter of too many people means not enough opportunity to talk. And too many times people are going to opt for advocation or advocacy more than Inquiry. Sure, it just makes sense, right? 60 seconds as opposed to 10 minutes means you're going to right. sort of focus on... Now, if, and if, a com if, if somebody has 12 or 13 people on their team out there, and it's too many, and that is, I think, don't think like, who are the two people I have to take off? Say, well, who are the five that really need to be here? Right, love it. Usually there is a... And they'll go, well, truly, it's the five of us that are the kitchen cabinet or the group of people that... It's like, that's probably your core team. Right, okay, yeah. Then, at once you guys are healthy, then learn how to incorporate the rest of the team, but know that your true team number one is those five. That's awesome. I love it. This is, the book's been out over a year now, right? No, actually, it's only been out for about eight months. Really? Okay, yeah. well, it's just, it's had that big an influence. Well, it's sold more than any book we've ever, we've ever brought out. It's quickly sold more than any, than, and it's amazing. We're finding that people are running with it and applying it and using yeah. it without us even knowing it. More people are coming up and saying, wow, we've, we've used it at our last offsite and it's changing our, our world. What is that? Do they need to take the fables and, and try to distill something and then apply it and this is already distilled and now I apply it? Or? I think it's two things. I think there's a lot of people that the fables, they really liked reading the fables, sure. but, but they, they, they weren't quite sure exactly how do I do that now. Yeah. But more importantly, and I think the biggest reason is because we put it all together. <laughs> all of our fables are in this book. Right. And so it's, the fables are good to understand one of the models, but when we put it all together in one place, people say, well, this is the field guide mm -hmm. that allows us now to go out and implement it. Yeah, and, and just for those who haven't read the book, it's, it's amazing. I, I think it's truly a, a gift to, uh, to be able to take literally eight or nine books, right, and put them all into this, and it's, it doesn't read dry at all. This has got a really nice natural flow to Thank it. You. The stories really, really help, obviously. Um, it's, I, I like it because it's, it's, it's dense but not dry, and there's a difference between the two. That's great to hear. We really worked hard to make it that way. We said we do not want a book that people are going to lose interest in. We've got to make it compelling, and even though we didn't have fiction to do that, we really worked hard to, to bring all the goodness in that. You did a great job. So is this the path from now on? Where do you go from here? You know, I think my next book is, I, I, I'm, I'm still so involved in promoting this book and, and implementing the ideas. I think that I'm going to write a book about the, the difficulty of being a leader, the personal story of, of you know, we all fail, mm -hmm. and the brokenness and the healing and the, and the concept of, of wrestling with who we are, but that's down the road a little bit. Cool. That's very exciting. We can't wait for it. Pat, always a pleasure. Thanks so much for your time. It's great to see you again. Cheers, you too.